So welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Ayan Shainitsky and I'm a software engineer at Red Hat in the Ovid uh, storage team. I'm uh, Fadi Oran, senior software engineer. I used to work with Ayan on the same team, currently working in multi-cluster management. Great, so let's start. So today we're going to talk about the new managed block storage in Ovid and how you can offload all your storage operation to the storage backend itself. So how many of you used or using now Ovid? Can you please raise your hands? Nice, thank you. I see uh, quite a lot of hands. Great to hear. So Ovid is an open source virtualization platform. It can allow you to manage and orchestrate virtual machines. As you can see here in the, the diagram, we have the Ovid engine, which is the management application written in Java. In Ovid, you can have uh, multiple uh, data centers. Each data center can contain uh, multiple clusters, and in each, cl in each cluster, you can have uh, several hypervisors, and of course, in each hypervisor, we can run multiple VMs. Also, for each data center, we must have sh shared storage and virtual networks. So if we already mentioned shared storage, in Ovid, we are supporting the traditional storage domains, storage types. For example, for block storage domain, we are supporting iSCSI and Fiber Channel. And for the file-based storage domain, we are supporting NFS, POSIX, Gluster, and local storage that resides on the host itself. For performing storage operations, we are, we are having, uh, in order to cre create disks uh, for VMs, uh, we, we need to perform uh, some operations to allow uh, disk operations for the VMs. For example, creating snapshots, cloning uh, disks, migrate from one storage domain to another, uh, creating templates, et cetera, et cetera. Those operations are quite complicated and requires a lot of synchronization. For example, uh, communicating with LVM, uh, maintaining new code chain, uh, storage migrations. Those operations take a lot of compute uh, from the hypervisor, which costs uh, when we run to run uh, VMs. And in order to perform those operations, we must lock the disks to prevent simultaneous operation uh, on the disk. And of course, because we are maintaining uh, the operation by ourselves, uh, it takes quite a lot of time to perform those operations. Also, when we are using traditional storage domains, uh, we are lose uh, the options to use uh, some more advanced storage features like uh, deduplication and compression. So how can we improve all those uh, problems that we mentioned before uh, when we are using the traditional storage domain? So maybe we can imagine someone that can do most of the storage offload uh, operation for us. Let's say we just call it uh, in order to perform the operation. And we don't care about how we done it. We just get the result. And maybe if it's going to be in the storage backend itself, uh, it can be implemented even better than we are doing. So we can gain, uh, we can reduce the complexity. And we can reduce time because operations are done on the storage side itself. So it's going to be much more faster. And we are still need to lock the disk, but for a shorter amount of time because all the operations are much faster. So actually, we, in Ovid, we had uh, that solution before. Uh, the old generation uh, of Cinder integration. Cinder is a block storage uh, for OpenStack. Uh, some of you maybe used it before. Can you please raise your hands or know about it? Okay, not a lot, which is good because it's currently deprecated. We are not supporting it uh, in the new version due to some uh, authentication uh, changes in OpenStack. And it has few limits. For example, in the old solution, we are supporting only Ceph as a backend. And uh, in order to use it, you need to create your own OpenStack environment. Okay, so how can we have someone else do all the hard work for us, right? It is always the best solution, I guess. What if we get all the goodies from Cinder and without the need of a fully deployed OpenStack? So let me introduce you to the Cinder library, aka Cinderlib. Cinderlib is a Python library that gives us an object-oriented abstraction of the Cinder drivers. And actually, it allows us to use those drivers without the need of any OpenStack deployment. 
And also, you won't need any of the Keystone for authentication, RabbitMQ for messaging, none of those services. Just a simple Python library that will give you access to all the storage drivers. So this library has been developed by Gorka, who is a Red Hat engineer working in the Cinder team. And he actually started to work on this solution to implement a, self, uh, sorry, a CSI driver. CSI is, compute, is a container storage interface, which is an API in Kubernetes to provide persistent storage to your container workload. So actually, it's kind of cool to see all the different projects using the same code base, right? It is actually spirit of open source, right? So a few words about Cinder drivers. And anybody here know about Cinder drivers? OK, so what are Cinder drivers? They are actually implementation of an API by the storage vendor themselves. For example, they need to implement all the provisioning for volumes, all the provisioning for snapshotting. And the good thing about that, that they actually know what are their APIs. OK, so if you have smart APIs inside your hardware, they will know which API to use. They just need to implement the right APIs towards Cinder. OK, there are about 80 supported Cinder drivers in, the, in Cinder. And when I say supported, I mean that they are active developers, but also CI subsystem that actually will validate every patch in the Cinder driver and in Cinder itself against real hardware. OK, so we won't have any patches that will block a, a specific uh, storage backend. Because this is an example of a storage configuration that you will get inside the Cinder configuration. It's a kind of key value uh, stuff. And only one of the parameters are common between the different vendors, which is actually the volume driver. So uh, this is actually the name of the Python library that is implementing the, the API. And all the parameters are really specific for the vendors. So you won't see any RBD pools, of course, inside a NetApp driver or a Lenovo driver or whatever. All of the parameters are documented inside uh, the OpenStack documentation, including all the defaults and all the parameters that are available. OK, cool. So now let's see how we can use Cinderlib. It is actually really, really simple. Just import the library as a Python library, and then we need to initialize the backend. The backend, it is the storage driver abstraction. Quite simple, giving the name of the driver. In this example, it is LVM volume driver. And then all the parameters that it will need. For example, the VG, right, the vo volume group that the volume will be created on. By the way, you can have multiple backend on the same code. Works fine. Next, we want to create a volume. Very simple, just call an API from the backend, giving the size and the name of the volume. You can give an ID or whatever you want. Next step, you have a volume, you want to use it, so we need to attach it. OK, very simple, just call a, a, a method in the volume, volume attach. In this example, it is a local attach. What does it mean? That the volume will attach on the operating system that the code is running on, OK? Once we have the volume attachment, we actually get the path, attach.path, which will give you the dev full path on the operating system, and you can start to write, by, write and read from the volume. Snapshot, also really simple. Just keep in mind that it differs between the different drivers. So in safe, it will be quite fast, I guess, but maybe in the LVM volume driver, it will be big. It takes some more time. What else do we have? We can extend the volume, delete the volume, of course, creating snapshot, deleting snapshot, but also cloning, cloning from an existing volume, cloning from snapshot. And actually, these are all the building blocks that we need to improve our Orbit disk operations. OK, great. So now we have the magic. We have this external worker that we dreamed of. We can offload all the storage operation to the storage backend itself. All we have to do is to teach over it how to use it. So let's see. In order to use Cinderlib, we have several constraints. The first one is we need access to the storage management API. Cinderlib needs to uh, communicate with the storage itself using the storage management API that can reside on a different network. We also need the metadata persistency. We are creating volumes, snapshots, uh, extending volumes, cloning them, delete. We need to know 
what operations have been done and persist them. Also, in the previous example that Freddy showed you, we performed a local attach. And in, uh, in over it, we need to perform a remote attach or, or detach of the volume to a virtual machine. Uh, by doing remote attach and detach, uh, a virtual machine can run on the hypervisor, but Cinderlib runs on a different machine. So we, need, so we need to allow that to happen. So in light of those constraints, we decided the following uh, architecture to integrate Cinderlib inside of Ovirt. Basically, we are creating, we are, we are added a new uh, Cinderlib executor, set of classes, Java classes, that uh, the whole, sole purpose is to run a Python, uh, Python code using a Cinderlib client. Cinderlib client wraps Cinderlib as a backend, and Cinderlib communicate directly to the storage management API. So uh, this solves us the first constraints to communicate directly to the storage management API using Cinderlib. The second constraint is uh, that we need the metadata persistency. So the engine already has a database. The engine database is a Postgres database. We just added a new one, a new schema, the Cinder database. And we are providing uh, Cinderlib all the communication info in order to uh, keep his old metadata and persist it on the Postgres database that the engine uses. So we solve the metadata persistency, we solve the uh, external management to communicate to the storage uh, API. And as you can see here, all the communication are done without the hypervisor to be involved. All the storage operations are done and the hypervisor doesn't know about them. The only operation that needs the involvement of the hypervisor is when we are running a VM. Then we need to perform a remote attach and detach uh, of the volume to the uh, virtual machines. And for doing that, uh, we are using OS Brick, which is a Python package uh, that's created by OpenStack. And Freddie will elaborate more about this later. So now that we know how we integrated Cinderlib inside of Ovid, let's see how we use it. So in order to add a managed block storage domain, we just select a new uh, storage domain. And as you can see, we added the new domain function. The new domain function is the managed block storage. We must differ between the new uh, storage domain, the managed block storage, and the traditional storage domain. Uh, because the implementation are done quite different uh, behind the scenes. Also, we must keep the UI as open as possible. As Freddie mentioned, we are supporting over 80 different drivers. Each driver can have his own parameters. And the only common parameter is the volume driver itself. So as you can see here, we have the volume driver and set of parameters that uh, uh, needed for adding a SEF as a backend. Also, you have the options to add uh, the driver as sensitive uh, drivers in the driver sensitive options. Uh, if you are inserting your passwords or example, uh, something like that, you can add it in this section. And all those parameters will be kept encrypted in the database of the engine. So once you inserted all your parameters, you press OK. The engine will do a connectivity check to the managed block storage and will validate that uh, it can be reached. Uh, the new managed block storage domain is not monitored yet. So this uh, small validation is required in order to validate that we have a communication to the storage itself. Great, so we added the new managed block storage domain. We can add a new managed block storage disk. Quite simple, just selecting a new disk, select the new managed block storage type, and select size. Basically, that's it. You have a new managed block storage disk. OK, cool. So now we have all the operation that uh, for provisioning, snapshots, everything done on the engine side. So the hypervisor is not doing anything. But we're in the business of running VM, right? So uh, we need to, to see what is different. Why the flow is different now? Mainly because the storage is not attached to the host all the time. So in NFS, in the NFS and iSCSI, the storage domain is actually always attached to the host to the, as part of the monitoring part of Ovirt. In our case, the storage is not attached to those. So we need to add a few steps before running the VM to be able to actually uh, connect to the disk and be able to write in data. OK, so let's take a look at uh, what is new in this flow. First, we needed some additional parameters from the host itself. We call it connector information. So as part of an existing API, we added 
um, the call from the hypervisor to gather this information, and we store it actually inside the engine DB. So the data is uh, is there, ready for us to uh, when we to use when we we want to run the VM. So what is this connector information? Actually, also it has, we are using the OS brick to get the same format as Cinder is using. What is this connector information? It is actually some parameters that we are getting from the host. Uh, for example, the IQ initiator that will be used for the SQZ connection, some IP address. Also, of course, if we are using multipass. And uh, all this stuff is stored in the, in the DB, and we will use it actually in the next step. Okay, so now the user have a VM. He configure a disk of a new type, and he wants to run the VM. First step, the engine will decide on which host the VM is going to run. It has different algorithms. Sometimes the user can uh, select the host that he wants to run. Sometimes he's just uh, checking what, uh, what host is, the, is more available for a CPU size, anything like that. Once we have the host that we want to run, we want to expose this volume to the host. Okay? Not all the loans on your backend storage is available to all hosts. There is some uh, access rules, some stuff like that that the management API need to open so that the host will be available to see actually the loan or the, or the disk. So collecting the volume is done using the engine, using the connector information that it mentioned before from the DB. Again, we're taking the volume ID and the Cinder drivers parameters to the Cinderlib. Cinderlib will call a connect method from the storage management API, and it will get the connection information uh, back to the engine uh, database. So what is the connection information? It is actually what, all what the host needs to be able to connect to a specific loan. Okay, so for ISCAS, it will be the loan ID, of course, IQN and portal, and also if uh, the target is already discovered or not. For RBD, so it will be a little bit different, just giving some uh, 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 key rings and password and stuff that uh, will be available for the host to, to connect. Cool, so now we have the connection information. We want actually to have the volume available on the host, so we need to attach the volume. So a new API on the hypervisor, attaching the volume, getting the connection information from the engine, and again using the OS brick library uh, to attach physically the volume to the host. Once everything is attached, we are getting the actual path on the operating system. Okay, so slash dev, slash dm25, which is the path that the loan is available. But in Ovirt, we are actually working with multipass, mainly for migrating VMs between different hosts. We want to keep the same path on all the hosts. So we are also providing the dev mapper, which is a multipass path, uh, back to the engine. From this point, we're actually getting, again, on the main flow that we had before. The engine will build the VM XML with all the parameters and the paths of the disk and send it to the, to the hypervisor that so will be using libvirt and QMU to run the VM. And that's it. We have a running VM. So uh, stopping a VM is actually the same thing, just the other way around. You need to start the VM first. That you've, you need to stop to write, write data to the volume. Then we're going back to the engine to disconnect the volume, and eventually it uh, will finish all the, all the flow. So what's next? There are a lot of uh, uh, features in storage in Ovirt, and not everything is still implemented on the managed block storage. For example, we have a list here of stuff that we want to do, like live storage migration, meaning uh, migrating the storage from a VM that is running, right? So without uh, actually uh, interfering in the, in the user workload. Disaster recovery, for example, in, uh, in NFS and iSCSI, all the data, all the OVF, all the XML of the VMs are also stored in the storage so that you can disconnect the NFS mount, mount it in a different engine, and you will be able to recover everything. So it's not currently implemented in uh, MBS. Storage migration between different type of uh, storage domain, uh, call migration when the VM is done. Actually, this one should be quite easy. Just attach the destination, the source, and just move the bits between them. Monitoring, as we mentioned, it's uh, quite important for us. And uh, some more points that uh, are mentioned here. Uh, regarding the packaging, uh, we, are some, we are working on it to have everything as part of the default of your installation. There are currently some manual steps, but hopefully we will get it uh, finished 
on the next release. Here are the links of the stuff we uh, talked about, in the lib on the OpenStack uh, documentation, also all the drivers and the feature page if you want to deep dive inside the obvious features. Okay, any question? Yes. If you refer to the uh, LVM object where you created, like the logic of volume of the volume compressor on it, then you were creating a snapshot. That's the old style snapshot that I assume, right? Uh, since in the lib is, a, I will repeat the question. So on the example where I'm showing the LVM diver, so it maybe it was not a good example, but it is exactly the same for Ceph or for a NetApp diver or for Caminario, or whatever, a Lenovo driver. So it is an abstraction. So you won't see what happens behind the scenes. So the snapshot really depends on the implementation. So I guess that in Ceph we know how it works, but uh, for LVM driver, you need to check what the code is doing. It, it could be, like you said, uh, the same way that we are doing currently in Ovid. Yeah, I agree. That's so maybe we could uh, make a better example next time. But uh, yeah. you need to, the, the drivers are open source. You can go and check every implementation of, the, um, of each driver and see what they are using. If it's something that makes sense or you maybe you don't want to use it. Yes. Any more questions? Yes. This feature is currently in tech preview. It's been released in uh, 4.3, but uh, it's still in tech preview. A lot of uh, missing parts uh, are there. Uh, so, but we are currently trying to provide a way to uh, add it to the default installation, and then we'll add uh, hopefully more features to support this. We saw already some uh, obvious users on the mailing list uh, using yeah. the, this feature, and we got some good feedback for now. It is actually, actually the, the faster way to use Ceph with Ovid. Yes, anyone else? Yes, please. Will there be like a growing overlap in terms of the uh, pair of over and open stack? What do you mean by overlap? Well, uh, the question is uh, what will be the difference of, uh, between OpStack and OVIR direction, maybe, and uh, yeah, overlap of a few features. Yeah. So here we want to actually reuse some code. So we like, we like to do that right in open source. We don't want to rewrite everything again. So the idea is to uh, use uh, something that has been widely uh, in use by a lot of users. And it is, uh, has been proved like uh, a good solution in, uh, in a lot of uh, uh, customers that uh, are uh, actually uh, happy with, uh, with OpenStack solution and the Cinder solution. And we want uh, to be able to use also all this uh, good stuff that is there inside Ovid. And uh, currently, OpenStack and Ovid are two different solutions for uh, virtualization, but eventually uh, we are using the same ideas regarding working with the disk. So most of the time, uh, it will be on the same page uh, on, on this kind of stuff. OK. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you very much.